everyone. I'm Jay McKeho Bigger, Director of the Midwest Writers Workshop. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to Conversations with an Author. Um, today, I'll chat with New York Times bestselling author, John Gilstrap, uh, who's a favorite faculty member as well. We'll talk about his books and uh, his writing process and he welcomes uh, any questions he'll answer. So uh, welcome, John. Um, Thanks for having get, me. Yeah, let's get started kind of at the beginning. Um, okay. You know, when I read uh, Nathan's Run years and years ago, I'm pretty sure I said to myself, uh, I think I will read every book that this <laughs> And, uh, and I have. And uh, so check out my bookshelf in the background. Um, there's a whole shelf of John Gilstrap books. So uh, we're just really pleased to have a chance to talk with you today. So um, to get started, John, uh, how did you, um, how'd you get the idea for your first book? And um, let's talk about how you uh, got it published and just tell us a little bit about that first book. Well, my, my first book was really, Nathan's Run was my fourth book, actually. The first three I wrote for the drawer, they, they just, you know, this is, this is a craft as much as it is anything else, and, and you have to learn the ropes. But Nathan's Run, as a story, and the story is about a 12-year-old boy who, uh, Nathan, who kills a juvenile detention center guard and escapes from the juvenile detention center. Uh, and he kills the guard because the guard was trying to kill him. So he did this in, uh, in, in self-defense, but that's not what the media sees. The media sees a dead guard and a kid on the run. And, and so the whole world is after him, including the, the person who tried to kill him to begin with. So that's, that's the basic story. Where it came from, it started, I wanted to write a story where someone, in this case, a cop, I wanted to be a cop. I was a firefighter at the time. So I, I was kind of in that, that uh, emergency response business. And firefighters are not as interesting as cops. Um, so I wanted to have a cop who had to make a binary choice between doing his job and doing the right thing. Couldn't do both. And I really didn't have any meat on the bones on that at all, but that's kind of what was churning in my head. And at the time I hadn't published anything. I was a safety engineer. I guess I still am um, not practicing. Uh, I had, a, I had a company in Prince William County, Virginia, and I was on a, a, a local board, a volunteer board that was called the Human Services Budget Integration Committee. So ultimately what it was, it was a bunch of civilians, residents who were going to cut the, or determine where to cut the human services budget for the county. And, you know, this is women's shelters and homeless shelters and juvenile detention center and, and uh, you know, all these it was kind of a daunting task and I was the chairman of this thing. And I thought it was important to visit these places. I owed them that much before I decided, you know, what, what we're gonna cut. So the first place I visited happened to be a juvenile detention center. And in Virginia at the time, a juvenile was a juvenile. So you have, you know, nine, 10, 11 year olds occupying the same space as 17 year olds. And, you know, incarceration, I think, is terrifying for most people anyway. And now you throw in the difference in ages and size and, and what have you. Um, I was fairly well appalled, actually. And there, during my tour, it was a very conducted tour, um, I saw this one little boy uh, in the corner sitting all by himself in this sort of multi-purpose room. It, it's a cafeteria and the basketball court kind of thing. And um, he just looked miserable. And he was all alone. Nobody was with him. He looked terrified. And right then I, I got this idea for the story and I wrote it in four months. Wow. Um, and that was the, well, how did you, how did you get it published? Did you find an agent or? Oh yeah. Uh, what was um, that? I, I went, I, I queried this. Okay. This is 1996. Okay. So there were no emails. This was all lick the stamp and close the envelope kind of, kind of query letters. And I was rejected 27 times by 27 different agents. And then I found one. Um, her name was Molly Friedrich. Uh, we're not together anymore, but she, it was, uh, she became my agent who then sold the book. But even there, there's this weird bit of serendipity. Uh, my original title for Nathan's Run was Nathan with an exclamation point, like, you know, Oliver or, 
Oklahoma, you know, just kind of, it was a bad title. I'm still bad with titles, actually. I still don't title most of my own books. That comes from the publisher. Um, and Molly got my, my query letter and she had given it to her assistant to type up my rejection letter, just based on the title. You know, if the guy can't do a title, then his book can't be any good. So in my query letter, I mentioned that I had gone to William and Mary and I did the um, writer in residence program there. And Sherry Holman, uh, who's now a producer on Longmire or was the producer on Longmire, but then she was Molly's assistant. Um, Sherry Holman also went to William and Mary. So she saw that and thought, well, let me just read the first few pages. And then she cycled it back to Molly who then chose to represent me and then sold it around the world for a couple of million bucks. Oh, that's that. Yeah, that's a great story. Yeah, yeah I mean, it doesn't it doesn't happen to everyone that way. No, right? no, uh, that's that's kind of that. Uh, yeah, that journey. So so you started writing uh, standalones um, yes. and you wrote um, four of them before you started the Jonathan Graves series. Well, I guess technically five, but the, the fifth one was a nonfiction book. So I guess that doesn't really count. Yeah, I didn't. I, I never took a seminar on marketing books or any of this. You, you sit down, you write the story and send it to the agent and then stuff happens. That's really my worldview at the time. And um, none of my early books, Nathan's Ryan at all costs, even Stephen and Scott Free were the, were the first four. They were all such self-contained stories and there was, no, there was no hook for a series in there. I mean, it's just the story was, was ended. I mean, what do you do with a 12 year old boy who's, you know, at, at the end of a, of a, of a novel. So, um, there were some career issues in there. The, the latter, the last two books, uh, Scott Free and even Steven didn't sell all that well. So I found myself in a bizarre spot of having a hard time getting any kind of a contract at all. And then I ran into, again, happenstance, pure serendipity. Um, a fellow named Kurt Muse, who was a political prisoner in Panama in 1989 and was ultimately rescued by Delta Force on December 20th, 1989. And uh, his story had never been told. His family had to escape. His, his two kids, his 15-year-old uh, daughter and 12-year-old son had to flee Panama as the PDF were trying to get them and hurt them. And they, they had to flee on their own. Uh, it just is, it's an enormous, wonderful story that ends with a Delta Force uh, raid at his prison where, and, and he was rescued on a helicopter, he was shot down twice. And so, you know, it's, it's this great thriller. And I wrote it as, as a nonfiction book. It, it came out, it did what he did, what it did. And I had all of this research now and um, it had nothing to do with it. I mean, it's the only, at that time, it was the only book that Delta Force had ever cooperated in. So, um, there, and I don't know that there have been others, but I know at the time, excuse me, that was the only one. And then I got this idea, there's a difference in, if, if you're kidnapped overseas or taken hostage, I don't know if there's a difference, um, the, the U.S. intelligence community starts working on your rescue right away. And if, if the rescue happens, nine times out of 10, it's going to be from local assets. You know, the, the, the French police will rescue the American hostage and, and all that. But there are parts of the, of the world where we're not all that friendly with the locals. And when that happens, the rescue will be either by uh, DevGru, SEAL Team 6, which isn't really a thing, but that's what they call themselves, or by Delta Force. Well, if that happens, when the balloon goes up on that, rescuing the hostage is the mission. That's it. Um, if you collect intel on the side and all that, that's fine. In fact, that's what they want to do. But the mission is the hostage. Now, if somebody's kidnapped in U.S. soil, because we, we've got this pesky constitution, right, which obviously is a really good thing to have, um, the, the, the rescue of a kidnapped victim will be handled either by the local police or by the FBI and its various iterations of the hostage rescue team. Well, here, uh, hostage taking is called by the teams. They're very hardworking people. I know these guys, they're I mean, really super folks, uh, but they call it a homicide in slow motion. There is, there's not a hundred percent expectation that they're gonna get the hostage back. The mission is really about making sure that the bad guy doesn't get away. 
the mission is about bringing justice to, to the, the kidnappers. Well, if you think about it, it's a, it's, a, it's a subtle but important difference. So I got this, it's a very long answer to a short question. So I got this, this, this idea to create a character, Jonathan Grave, who's a former uh, Delta operator, and he provide it, and he, he brings that foreign model to domestic uh, kidnappings. So, you know, he's the guy you hire when you, he doesn't care about constitutional rights. He doesn't care, he, but his, his mission is to reunite the good guys, you know, to, to take the hostage and back to his family. So I, I got this idea uh, for, for the character and that was what, 13 books ago. Is that, that's how many Jonathan Grape yeah. books? Yeah. Um, do, so where, where do the ideas for the individual books come from? I mean, obviously there's, there's different plots of different hostage situations and, and um, um, where do those ideas come from? Do you do a lot of extra research or is it just... Uh, well, some of it is reading the news. You know, if, if you can't if, if you can't write a thriller these days, then you're not a thriller writer. Okay, I mean, this is it's just it's it's that kind of world right now. Um, it comes from bizarre sources. I um, I did a a, a book called um, what was it called? It'll come to me. <laughs> I guess it, when you when you write enough books that you don't remember what the, the name was. Are, Scorpion Strike. It was Scorpion Strike. Um, my wife and I were at this this wonderful beach um, in Puerto Rico and just sort of enjoying the sun and you know the butler brings you the the Mai Tais and you know it's just it was really a lovely place and I was sitting there and I said to Joy I said to my wife wow this place has no security at all you know, that everybody's half naked right nobody's armed nobody's prepared for violence I thought, what a great place for some hostage takers to come especially if it's a place where everybody's rich you talked to your wife about that, huh? So, and the trip became tax deductible. So, you know, it's the- Win-win. It, it's a win-win. So, you know, I was walking along the, the Woodrow Wilson Bridge is the main bridge that connects, I live in Northern Virginia, and it's a bridge that connects Northern Virginia with, with Southern Maryland across the Potomac River. And there's a beautiful fall day, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, and um, you can walk across the bridge. It's a gorgeous view and breezy day. And I thought, you know, at rush hour, this place is chock-a-block. Nobody can move. And if it's a football night and Washington Redskins, or excuse me, the Washington football team is, is playing, nobody moves at all. And I thought, wow, a couple of people with automatic weapons, you know, can really just, what, what a great terror attack. And, and that, be, that became um, the third that, book in the, in the that series. That was your plot. Yeah. Yeah. And then you build the plot around it. And then you start asking, well, why would they do that? And then what would happen and what would happen? And how does Jonathan get involved? And so sometimes it just starts with a kernel of an idea. A lot of uh, what ifs, right? Mm -hmm. When you're, when you're writing, do you, um, do you work from an outline or do you, are you, do you just, uh, uh, as they say, uh, right by the seat of your pants? Um, what's your, what's your process for? I used to, I used to outline a lot. Um, I used to pretend to outline a lot. One of my mentors uh, in, in this business is Jeffrey Deaver, and mm -hmm. he is famous for writing these you know, 40, 50 page outlines, scene by scene outlines. And I thought, well, that must be how you're supposed to do it. <laughs> and, and what I found was I would spend all this time writing an outline, and then I would write the book, and the book looked nothing like the outline. So I, I just started skipping that. So what I, I start now with a premise, and you know some set pieces. I write thrillers, so it, there's set pieces along the way. And you know I always like having a satisfying ending. You know, so it, it's how how do the good guys win? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really kind of a voyage of discovery to the point that because um, I owe a book a year now, I'm writing two books a year. Um, I'll find myself in a corner that I, oh crap, I probably shouldn't have done that. And then I realize I don't have I don't have the luxury of going back and changing it. Okay, I gotta become Jonathan and figure out how to, how to get out of this, you know? Yeah. And, 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 that's, and that's fun. It's like, it, it, when I was a kid, you know, we'd, go, we'd play guns and we'd do this and you know, all the, it's, it's just about having a good pretend for me. Well, speaking of guns, uh, your books have so much research and, and uh, well, so much 
I wonder about your research because there there's uh, uh, so much description of of all the the weapons and you know and uh, the uh, process the um, the equipment. Um, how do you do that? Uh, is it any hands on uh, j or just uh, go to the Google it? No, Jonathan has never handled a weapon that I have not handled. He's mm -hmm. never shot anything that I have not shot. And uh, I'm blessed to be a member of a, a, a National Sports SSF National Shooting Sports Foundation um, has an annual event called the Shot Show. And the SHOT Show is to guns and weapon systems what the Detroit Auto Show is for cars. It's where everybody brings out all their new stuff and what have you. And because I'm media, I go out to this day at the range, you know, where you can shoot pretty much. I fired grenade launchers. I've shot, oh my. You, know, you know, all the, the heavy caliber stuff. And, and, um, and I know, so, you know, I've, I've played at the SEAL compound in, in Virginia Beach. And, and so... It's stuff that you accumulate over time, mm -hmm. and I do like guns. You know, I'm I'm mm -hmm. a I'm a shooter in my spare time, and so yeah. And I used to be in the explosives business way back in the day. Wow. My first safety job was at an explosives manufacturing plant, so I know a lot about that side of things. So, too. you know, it's, just, it's like I've been training to be a thriller writer, and I didn't. Uh -huh. So things that go boom and things that go bang, right? Yeah, exactly. Bangs there and booms. There you go. Well, what happens when you when you get in in a writer's block? Um, how do you, how do you work your way out of it? I don't think writer's block is a thing. Oh, I think writer's block is, um, lack of preparation. I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I mean, I, there are days where I sit down and it's like, Ooh, I really don't know what I'm going to write today. Um, but it's, it, it's a matter of, of working through it, working the problem. Um, if, um, if there's a, if you're not writing, if you're, if you're managing something or if you're building a bridge or you're, there are always these creative uh, moments where you think, well, how am I going to solve this problem? It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be writing. It's anything you do. How do I solve the problem? And writer's block is that, that moment when you're not sure how you're going to solve it. And in my case, the only way to, there's two ways actually to solve it. The, the first is to show up, put your butt in the chair, and make yourself right. And it's, it, it doesn't have to be good. It just has to be. And the other thing that I will do that always works for me is to um, change the media. Uh, I have a collection of fountain pens. I've, I've always enjoyed fountain pens. And you look at my handwriting, you wouldn't think that I would like fountain pens, but I always do. And I have, it, it, it always works that if I've, I've just hit sort of a creative roadblock, I change media. I get a, a, I have notebooks. There's a, there's a paper notebook, a very nice notebook that I get, leather covered notebook for every book. And uh, I probably write 25% of the books, eh, maybe not that much, 20% of the books by hand and wow. then transpose it over. And there's something about the tactile part of writing that somehow breaks the, the words free for me. I don't understand it. I don't, I don't really understand anything of what I do. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's just, I, I, I sit down and, and, and work through it. So I think when people say they have writer's block, I think it's too easy a phrase. Mm -hmm. um, writer's block is maybe you're telling the story from the wrong point of view. Maybe um, the scene doesn't belong. Uh, maybe it's the wrong story. You know, there's, there's all kinds of, of issues that, that can cause the creative sort of roadblock in your brain, but there's nobody else going to write it for you. Mm -hmm. so the only way to handle the writer's block is to unblock it. And I like what you said. I mean, it doesn't have to be good at first. You just have to have to have to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and sooner or later, just the, the act of, of writing I, I'm not, I don't do journaling. I don't do any, my life's not interesting enough to be journaled. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, you get yourself with your characters and you just start writing. I've written, I've, yeah, I've gone five or 600 words into writing crap before I refine the thread of the story. And then you just keep going and you go back and, and fix it later. That's what's nice about computers and word processors now. Back when I was, did my first three books, the well, first two books, it was typewriters. And 
you know, the, you didn't quite have that same freedom to just pound away and, and then right. fix it later. Do you have, do you always write in, uh, in, in a certain place, like in an office or does it, does it help to, uh, you know, do you go to a coffee shop or out in the park or? I, for years, I wrote probably 10, 12 books while I had a full-time job and, um, and I traveled a lot. So I, I didn't then have the luxury of only writing from an office. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes you go and sit at the bar, um, after work, you know, if, if I'm on travel and, you know, just sit there and, and write, you know, eat there and, and spend four or five hours. You always have to leave a good tip because you've occupied the space for a long time, but you know, sit and, and I can write there. I can write in coffee shop. I can write on my lap now because writing is, is full-time. I, I got rid of the big boy job. Um, and now I, I pretty much always work out of my office uh, or on a laptop or something like that. If I really, and if I do get writer's block, and I, tell, I don't know if you can see it. This is the this bar in my basement. I have yeah. actually come and recreated those moments. Oh, there I, there's, you go. I'll turn on. Uh, you can uh, on YouTube. There are there's like coffee shop noises. Oh, you know, as a sound effect. Oh. I've done this. I'll turn that on and I'll sit here at the bar and it's just it's a different. It's kind of a different environment and it and it will help me. And it'll help help you. That's good. Um, well, how many drafts do you normally, uh, do you normally write, um, for, for your novels and do you have, um, like early readers or anybody that, um, uh, critiques what you've written, um, give you a second opinion? Well, it, the, on the first one, the number of drafts, it's interesting. There, there are two absolutely truthful answers. One is 50 <gasps> or one. Oh, was... And they're both true for every book because what I do, I start every writing session by rewriting what I wrote the previous session. So on any given day, I will, you know, as, as the book progresses, I'll be 30 or 40 drafts into the book to get to chapter, you know, 24 that I'm writing today. So by the time I'm done this, this, you know, one step forward, two steps back kind of, kind of thing, um, it helps you, it helps me really understand my story and my characters better and everything gets polished along the way. And if I get deeply into the book, if I get in the final third of the book and I realize, well, well, crap, I've got a, the house needs a second story or this character doesn't work or whatever, I will go back and fix that and then and move forward. So when I'm done on the end of my first draft, really all I have to do is go back and do a quick polish from the beginning to the end and I'm done. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not, so it's a lot of drafts, but not the way people think of drafts. Right, right. And uh, do you have anybody that reads what you've written? Not until I'm done. Okay. I don't want, on the one level, I think it's, it's kind of rude. If I know something is, is broken, if I know it's not right yet, why do I want to take somebody else's time uh -huh. to tell me what I already know? I might know, not know why it's broken, but I know that it is broken. So I belong to a critique group. We meet once a month and I don't share something. We, we share snippets, maybe 10, 15 pages of, of stuff when we meet. Um, and they're all very well published, um, award-winning, best-selling author types. And um, so, there's there there's none of the faint praise stuff really kind of right, go right for the jugular to to what doesn't work which is fine with me you know I, it's it's you have you have a very thick skin right well you know if you think about it I every editorial letter I get I just oh. got one for for um, stealth attack comes out in July I just got my editorial letter yesterday and you, oh, there's always this first paragraph I really enjoy the story I think your fans are really going to like it too da 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 da, da. but but, and, and there are some things to improve. Everything north of but doesn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, that, doesn't, that doesn't make the book better. That that's, tells me what's already there and that's fine. It's good for the ego. I, you know, writers all have egos. We're very sensitive, creative people. <laughs> but it's the corrective stuff that, that I wanna read. And it's always by that point, because it go, it's going to my editor, by that point, um, I have given her what I th think is really good. And now I'll find 
you know, where the, where the weaknesses are. Uh, my wife is an early reader typically, um, but she, her, her reading is not on the technical, technical is the wrong word. Um, she's about character and story and as A lead to B lead to C, uh, mm -hmm. not into the nitty gritty of, of the mechanics and structure mm -hmm. of a story. Um, and my agent, of course, reads it, but that's pretty much it. And then, um, and as far as do I get input from people? Oh, yes. Once a book is published, my goodness, there you, you go. get all kinds of input. <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. Well, um, what, were the, what, what were the challenges that you had um, with, with starting a first book? Maybe that you can help um, uh, new writers with. You know, I think one of the big, the biggest problems now, and I, I, I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook. There are writers' boards and such they do uh, participate in. One is, I, it's either fiction writing or writing fiction. I forget which one, but it's got like 125,000 members in it. And so I, I read through these things, and everybody is so uptight. Everybody's so, you know, they just, it doesn't matter especially if it's your first book, it doesn't matter. I presume you have another source of income. You're feeding your family. You're doing, you're, you're taking care of your life. Um, you're just, you're just making stuff up and you're putting it down on the page. Relax, enjoy it. Just don't, it, it doesn't matter. And when I was writing Nathan's Run, and my first, the first published book, it was actually, like I said, it was my fourth book. It was another, as I was writing it, it was another book for the drawer. I didn't, I didn't, think I was going to get it published until I realized that, hey, this is pretty good. You know, as an avid, voracious reader, I would read what I'd written and I realized that that I had tapped into something. And the something that I had tapped into is this. For the first time, I wasn't writing a book. Mm -hmm. I wasn't doing that, that constipated, uh, concentrate on every word kind of thing. What I did was I told a story to the page. To the degree that when people read my, my writing, they often say it's kind of creepy because they actually hear me telling them the story. It's oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, now that I know you, I'm, I'm like that, too. <laughs> and so I, I think the biggest advice is to relax and enjoy it. It's supposed to be fun. If it's not mm -hmm. fun, don't do it. Yeah, that's... Um... Yeah, it's supposed to be fun. And if you have that passion, um, uh, you need, just need to stick with it. And um, that's, uh, so you said that you are very bad with, with titles. You don't title, um, you just say like, like Jonathan Gray book seven or. Um, uh, well, actually, it's even shorter than that. It was, I just finished for a long time. The file was grave 13. Oh, gee. And, um, and, you know, the previous one was, was the one that just came out in July. Um, Hellfire. Was Hellfire. Mm -hmm. And the one I'm writing now uh, will come out next July. It's called Stealth Attack. Quite honestly, I'm not all that happy with the title, but I can't think of a better one. Um, but, you know, it's just, the, for me, and I don't want this to sound too cynical, but there are stages of how people buy books. Mm -hmm. The first stage is the cover. You know, it's well, or the, the name of the author, right? You, at, at a certain you, level, you help right? Pick out the cover. Do you have input into what the cover yeah. looks like? No, and I don't want it. I am, I am graphically challenged. Oh, <laughs> I, I don't know good from bad. You know, it's, it's just I don't think that way. Um. So then, they, you know, if they're attracted to the cover, then they see the title, and then they read the first page, and if they like the first page then maybe they will buy the book. And then there comes a point that the cover and the title don't matter. There, I have a book called Friendly Fire. It's one of the grave books. It's one of my favorites of the, of the grave books. It's got this really cool looking red cover and it's got the White House on it. Well, okay, the White House doesn't appear anywhere oh. in, in the book. I mean, it's, it's just, it's an attractive cover. It gives you, it's kind of an inside Washington story, but, um, but the imagery really doesn't matter. And I've never once, and that's why I'm going to tee it up now. I've never once gotten a letter from anybody saying, well, what a stupid cover. Why are you doing that? Uh, the second grave book was called Hostage Zero. It's a cool title. It means nothing. Oh, yeah. That's... There's not like Hostage Prime or Hostage Four, you know, it's just they Hostage give, Zero. Do they, do they give you some options on the, on the title or they just say, no, we're just going to go with this? I have a veto. 
you know, okay. if I really don't like it, and I've only cast it maybe twice, I just didn't like the title. And, yeah. um, but, but no, they don't seek my input. They did early on until they realized I had nothing to you offer. Had none. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All my suggestions are bad. <laughs> Yeah. So, oh, that's that. Well, that's good. So, so you uh, are writing the Jonathan Grave, and now you have just started a new series. So, why don't you tell us about that one? Crimson Phoenix is the first um, first book in a new series that features Victoria Emerson, and it's we're still struggling. It comes out in February, and and we're still trying to figure out what genre it is. I want to call it post-apocalyptic in oh. the sense of On the Beach uh, or Alas Babylon, you know, the, the, those stories, the, the nuclear stories that we read when I was a kid. But now post-apocalyptic means zombies and stuff. Right. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not that, okay? So um, Victoria Emerson was, uh, where is, well, I guess was, the um, representative from West Virginia's fourth con congressional district. And on the brink of nuclear war, she is evacuated, and this is a real thing, really do this, was evacuated to a shelter that is for the House of Representatives and the Senate. But it's for the member and one staff member, no family. And she's a single mom, she's got three kids, and so she quits and says, I'm not, I'm not going to a bunker. And um, so the war comes, it's pretty devastating, you know, a couple hundred million people die. We don't actually know how many people die, but it's, it's, it's a very hot war. But that means, you know, a couple hundred million people live too. So um, she is, this, uh, Victoria is, is, she can't not be a leader. All she wants to do is reunite with her family. And along the way, she encounters these, these complications that she has to get involved in or she gets sucked into. So what's happening in, within Crimson Phoenix, the, the first book in, in, the, in the series, is we're seeing her establish herself. She's a, the, the outsider that people turn to to help solve their problems. And it's, it's, just a, it's a really fascinating and fun series to be writing. It, it's very exciting. Um, and I will tell you, for those of you who are watching, um, if you send an email, that in the subject line, just put contest, uh, john at johngillstrap.com. That's my email address. Um, send the email to, to um, contest, and I will choose two of you uh, to get a free copy of, of the book uh, through NetGalley. So it'll be ebook, or if you prefer um, to have a paper copy, I can do that too. Still, it'll be two winners, uh, but I can do a paper copy too. Just put paper. <laughs> if, 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 and just so you know what you're getting, these are advanced readers copies. So this is not um, the finished book. It's a nearly finished book, but you're going to find some typos and stuff in it. They're called um, uncorrected page proofs is what they used to be called. And now they're called advanced readers copies or ARCs. So if you want, if you want to get an early copy, um, let me know. So say that again, where they need, what they need to do. Send an email to john at johngillstrap.com. Mm -hmm. and put in the subject line contest and if you want it if you're specifically you want a paper copy put contest dash paper oh and, that's good that's good a random well, number generator and pick out two winners there you go there you go well i have i have my my copy and that is my weekend reading so i am excited about that so are you writing this from uh the female point of view I guess, point. you know, I, I, here, okay, another inside baseball thing. I don't, I don't, I reject the notion that there is a male point of view or a female point of view. Um, there's, particularly at the level that I write, um, meaning I don't write romances, I write thrillers. So, uh, you're, nobody's pining over lovers or, you know, that, that sort of thing. In the Grave series, um, Irene Rivers is the director of the FBI. I mean, she's tough as nails. Vinicia Alexander is, is the, the computer whiz. Um, I write about people solving their problems and solving other people's problems and you know, sort of bringing justice to bad guys. To me, it doesn't matter that they're male or female or, I mean, you know, you can't overdo that obviously, but, um, 
I, it's, so is it from Victoria's point of view? Yes, she is a point of view character, but she's one of several points of view, point of view characters. But um, it's not a, I've never thought of it. You're the first one to ask me that actually. Okay. I've never, never thought of it of, of, as being a female point of view. How did you get the idea for this series? Again, vacationing with my wife. We were well, leaving, <laughs> we were leaving Muncie, uh, actually Indy. We had been to a um, uh, Magna Coom Murder. And we had driven out from, from Northern Virginia, out the Northern route. Boy, is there a lot of Ohio. Whew. And then we came back the Southern route, which took us toward the, to the Greenbrier um, Resort, which is in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. It's kind of where Virginia, the toe of the boot of Virginia meets West Virginia and Tennessee. And um, that used to be the US government relocation center until uh, Washington Post uh, revealed the secret in the early 90s. So, um, it was built during the Eisenhower administration as the evacuation center in the event of a nuclear war. And everything is hidden in plain sight. You know, the blast doors and, and all this stuff, the, the, the shelters themselves were just exhibit halls for people who did um, uh, trade shows and such. And I was so fascinated by this and uh, taking the tour, it was really just remarkable. And then... I learned that you can't bring family. Hmm. And I just, I don't know how, that would be very, very challenging um, to say, okay, see you kids. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna live in a bunker. Sorry, you're gonna turn into charcoal. Yeah. Um, it, it's just, so that's, that's where the story was born. Do you, uh, when you get these little nuggets, um, do you have like a notebook that you uh, uh, keep track of all these ideas? No, I have, I believe that if it's, you know, I, I don't, I don't write a whole bunch, right? It's, it's one or two books a year. If the idea is strong enough, it'll stay with me. Mm -hmm. If I forget the idea, then it wasn't meant to be written. That's, <laughs> that's my view of it. That's your view. That's yeah. your view. I mean, so. people, I hear about people carrying notebooks and, and having notebooks next to the bed. Oh my God, I cannot imagine. <laughs> you, if, first of all, I wouldn't be able to see what I was writing. Exactly. <laughs> And then reading it, you or, know, or read it or read it later. It wouldn't exactly. make sense. Yeah. So, um, well, since uh, Midwest Writers Workshop is in Muncie, Indiana, um, I thought it was very cool that you included Muncie uh, as a setting in in uh, in one of your books. That was in No Mercy. It was the first grave book, and not only that, it was a student from Ball State University. Exactly. The very first person that Jonathan Grave ever rescued was a music major from Ball State University. Yeah, yeah, that that was really cool. I think I have that underlined in my book. So it's like, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, well, especially since you have been, uh, uh, you have taught at our conference for, oh goodness, um, uh, a, few times. a number of times, and yeah. are one of the uh, one of a favorite faculty. So, what what do you think about uh, writers' conferences, and um, are is it worth it for? writers to go? Uh, is there, there a, a benefit uh, besides hearing you, of course? When of course, of course. Well, you know, who would not do that, right? There you go. Um, you know, I think, yes, they're worthwhile provided the, the writer knows why he's there or she's mm -hmm. there. Um, I think it's an utter waste of time if you don't take a strategic approach, approach to a conference. Now, you you don't have a, uh, Midwest Writers is, is not a conference. That's a workshop. Mm -hmm. And that's where people get intense. They, they workshop their, their, their material. That's a different kind of, that's, it's almost an academic setting. Um, so obviously, you know what you're, everybody knows why they're there. They're there to either sell their stuff or get input on their stuff or, or improve their writing. It's a workshop. Um, but you, if places like um, uh, Magna Cum Murder or BoucherCon or Thriller Fest or, or Romance Writers of America and you know, all the, they have all these big writers conferences that are really, you know, they're conferences and parties. Uh, those are a complete waste of time unless, unless, and, or they're extraordinarily valuable. Um, if, if people show up as writers, not fans, okay, if, if you're, or you're there because you're a writer and 
your sole focus is to attend these panel discussions that, that are going on, I think you've wasted a lot of money to go. If on the other hand, you want to um, meet resources that can help your career, and that's what you're doing at that point, if you're trying to sell your stuff, you've got a job and, and you're trying to build a career, then you have to have a strategic approach. Know who it is you want to meet. You know, it's um, the, typically there are agents and editors and, and such that attend these things and you know who they're going to be. Do your research, you know, find out what, what this agent, what kind of stuff he or she represents. Is that a good fit for you? And then figure out a way to meet them. Uh, everybody is at the bar. I will tell you that, that, you know, a hundred percent of all business in this business is conducted at the bar, a hundred percent. And, and that's where everybody is. It's a little like shooting fish in a barrel. Um, so if that is where, if, if, if your book is about to come out or, uh, no, let's go there. Okay. So you've already found your agent. You've already found an editor. Your book is about to come out. Now you want somebody to blurb your book, you know, the front, it's a, a riveting read, John Grisham, you know, whatever. Um, that's where the conferences are where you're going to make the contacts with other authors that and say, it. sure, I'll blurb your book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So, well, we, um, Midwest Writers, uh, because everything has gone virtual this year, we had a, uh, a terrific virtual conference uh, this summer, and now we are getting ready to have an agent fest um, in about a month. And of course, that's going to be virtual. So we won't be able to be at the bar, but um, it's a very unique opportunity, John, for a, a writer to Zoom one-on-one -on -one with an agent. Oh, wow. So um, yeah, and there will be 18 different sessions that will be recorded and they can watch later um, the agents that the agents are presenting. So it's, it's different, but we're um, uh, hopeful that um, there'll be a lot of community and connections and, and um, um, maybe some agents that will uh, find the, the writers that they're looking well, for. Any luck at all, you know, in my mind, Two years from now, we're not even going to speak of 2020. We're going to pretend <laughs> that the year just didn't happen. <laughs> uh, so, so you know, obviously, everything is different this year, yeah. and yeah. Uh, so, including I guess the the rules that prevail. But you know, there's the, just closing out the conference thing that all businesses, this one included, it's everything is is uh, people to people. You know, it's yeah. a, it's a, this is a contact-based business. And, you know, if, if and, and I know that a lot of writers are inherently shy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the rare extrovert among writer types. And you know, something writers need to get over mm -hmm. if, if they're going to succeed in the business because you got to meet people and you got to get out there, you got to be seen you can always sleep for three days afterwards, you know, and, yeah. and, and you can pretend to be happy while you're doing all of this, but um, it's never lose sight of the fact uh, that, and this is for everybody who's, who's watching this, who's, who wants to break into the business, understand it's a business and it can, it's conducted exactly like every other business. It's about contacts and, and you're the boss, you know, you can't hide behind your boss. It's, yeah. you are, you're, you are, you're the, the factory worker and you are the product, right? So, um, so the, the, the answer about conferences is yes, I, can think, I think they can be very, very valuable, but the attendee has to work. While right, they're... right. Well, um, this has been a wonderful chat. Um, if, if, if anyone has a, a question for John, you can put it in, uh, um, in the chat box. Um, uh, we have one from uh, Elizabeth Haynes that said, thank you both. I've enjoyed watching this and have learned so much. Uh, love the bar in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never, I never thought of that. That's a, um, uh, so um, yeah, uh, you just turn around and, and, and you, you can get your beverage, right? Exactly, exactly. And for the record, this is really water. So, okay. Okay. Well, that was that's what good. time is it in, in about 14 minutes or when we get off, it'll be the same color, but we'll have olives in it. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. That sounds good. That sounds good. Um, 
So anyone else has a, have, has a question, just uh, put it in the chat and uh, John will be happy to answer anything. And, and uh, don't forget to send uh, an email to him and request your copy of, of, uh, of his new series. Crimson Phoenix. Exactly. Yeah, and you're already working on the second one, I assume, John? No, I just finished the latest grave book. I will start probably Monday. I'll start on the next one. I know what it's going to be. So, it's... do you get up? Do you have a special time? Are you you get up and write early in the morning? I am typically up by the crack of ten. Oh, there you go. I like that. <laughs> um, no, you know, the morning is typically um, coffee and emails and that kind of stuff. My real writing time is probably noon to four. Noon yeah. To four. Yeah, so that's you. You do the the business kind first, and and uh, and then get down to writing after lunch. Huh? Right. Yeah, I I am not a morning person as well. So um, I I tried to get up and write, and I I can't get my eyes open to do it. So <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Patricia says thank you so much. She really enjoyed the interview. So um, yeah, I have too. Uh, Dennis said, uh, the, what's the release date for Crim Crimson Phoenix? Crimson Phoenix comes out February 23rd. February 23rd. When will it be available for pre-order? I think it is. Oh, is it now? I think oh. so. That's good. Um, uh, is that on your, on your, on your website? Actually, you know what? <laughs> It probably isn't. I, I don't think, no, it's not on my website yet, but I know that. I, I thought you. I, I should, that. you know what? I, I should there. take care of that, shouldn't I? I think you should. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, would be but, good. But any, and all the retailers, you know, Amazon or Walmart or. Right. You know, right. Or, um, uh, tell us a little bit about your, um, your YouTube channel. Okay. Um, it's author John Gilstrap. Um, not to be confused with my Facebook page, which is John Gilstrap author, because I didn't think that through very well. So <laughs> author John Gilstrap, I call it a writer's view of writing and publishing. I think there's 31 videos on there now. And it's just kind of an inside view on uh, how the industry works and some creative issues. I'm going to be doing more of those, I think, as, as, as we go on. But, you know, do you want to know how a movie deal is structured? That's there. Do you need an agent? What do agents do? What do editors do? What are the different... Um, uh, milestones in writing a book. It's a, they're relatively short. I think the, the longest one is 15 or 16 minutes. Um, and that's what I just did. I, I was posted a couple of days ago. It's called building your author platform, which uh, has a lot of moving parts to it. Uh, but it's, um, it, I enjoy doing them. People seem to enjoy watching them. Um, got up to a hundred thousand views uh, just last week. So that's pretty cool. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, can they, they uh, can subscribe to your channel and you have a, a, a newsletter, I suppose, to let them know when. Yeah. If you go to my website, you know, all things lead to the website. So if you go to johngillstrap.com, you can sign up for the newsletter. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel or you can go to YouTube and sign and subscribe mm -hmm. to the YouTube channel. Um, but yeah, it's, I try to be as, as visible as I can. I respond to all my own, I, I respond myself to all emails. Yeah. Not always as quick as I would like to be, but it depends on where I am in the cycle of a book. If, right, if, you, exactly. if you send me an email and I'm I'm a week from deadline, you're not hearing from me. No, for, right, for right. A week. So um, yeah, I try to be as visible as, as I can. This whole pandemic thing is killing me. You know, I love doing these conferences and, and workshops and, and yeah. what have you. And um, it's... It's tough. It's been hard. Yeah. You got a note from uh, Daryl Fowler. Uh, he said, it was good seeing you uh, again, WPA. And he said he can't wait to read Crimson Crimson Phoenix. So, All right. WPA, uh, I'm going to guess that is Writers Police Academy. I was going to ask you. Okay. And actually, uh, again, it's been, I don't think it's happening this year. But if you write crime fiction, um, Writers Police Academy is it, it's run by Lee Laughlin. Um, it oh, is exactly he, what it sounds he, like. He actually has been to Midwest Writers too. Great guy. Oh yeah, and he Graveyard Shift. I think he's got a website too. I'm not I'm not sure what that is, but the the conference w, uh, Writers Police Academy. You will shoot guns. You will drive cars. You will investigate crime scenes. You will. I mean, this is not this isn't like on a screen. This is 
real stuff. Well, the crime scene is not real, obviously, but the, the guns are real. Uh-huh. And wow. um, so it, it's really, uh, it, it's, it's great. It's exhausting for, yeah. for attendees. For um, Kathy Akers Jordan says, yes, it is Writers Police Academy and it was virtual this year. And um, uh, Daryl said um, that it's now called Murder Con. And it was in 2014. And uh, Lee Laughlin's website is leelaughlin.com. All so, right. Hey, yeah. Lee, you owe me, dude. I better, yeah, I better see my know. stuff promoted on your site. Right, right. I think so, too. <laughs> so, well, um, this has just been a wonderful chat, a nice way to end a week. And we appreciate you taking the time, John, to tell us about your new books and to encourage writers um, to just do it. Yeah, that's really it. it it's a matter of <clears throat> get out of your head. Um, the, it really doesn't matter what music you have on. Your muses are not going to come and talk to you. The, um, you know, it, it's, <clears throat> imagine if, if you want to take this seriously, if you actually want to write for publication, you got to write. And the first thing I do is write. And that means showing up. And uh, even even if you don't necessarily want to, uh, ultimately, not, none of this happens without you doing it. And, and there are no, one of the things I, I always love talking to new writers about, the questions that begin, can I do this? You know, can I, I'm not supposed to start with weather. I can't, you know, all these things. There are no rules. This is a creative endeavor. There are no rules. The only rule is it has to resonate with the reader. And in order for it to resonate with the reader, they have to have something to read. So all things start with, with writing. Don't worry about if it's good. It doesn't matter if it's good. Get it on the paper, or get it on the page, and then you can make it better. But it sucks when it's in your head, yeah. you know, and, and until it's, it's, it's written down. Just, you know, have a great pretend. Go to that place in your head and talk to your imaginary friends. Right, exactly. So, um, well, uh, a lot of good advice and um, we wish you well on, uh, on these next books. Thank um, you. It's going to be exciting to, uh, to read two John Gilstrap books a year. I might have to build another shelf. Okay. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That, would, like be, that. that, that would work. That, no problem <laughs> with that. So uh, thank you again, John. And for those that are interested in the Agent Fest, um, just check our website, uh, midwestwriters.org. And uh, you, there's still time to register. You can meet with three agents and pitch your book idea. So uh, now's a good time to do it. Just get, get, get this done before the end of the year. So thank you, John. You bet. Thank you. Take care. Have a great weekend.